Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for the invitation to come and share my ideas and some experiences with you. The areas I would like to talk about this afternoon are um, uh, to present data uh, about the intersection of the epidemics of HIV and the epidemic of what some people call an epidemic of incarceration in the United States, and to show why this is important from a public health perspective. Then going to talk about the movement underway of the, the seek, test, and treat paradigm in HIV, or what I think is more appropriately called the, the test, treat, and retain model, and how it, uh, it in specifically is applied to criminal justice settings. And then the, the third part is, uh, is really a pitch to join me in this effort and to um, uh, introduce myself as a new person on campus who's involved in this research and uh, discuss why there are some interesting and unique opportunities to study HIV and, and, and related communicable diseases uh, in the criminal justice setting uh, and outside the criminal justice setting. So before getting into the talk, I want to express my general enthusiasm of having been hired here at a school of medicine and public health. So as a clinician who aspires to have some impact on population health, it's a privilege to, to meet with you all who, for whom it's, it's your discipline to do population health. Um, in this slide, you know, this is the, the lesser uh, Greek god, Asclepius, who gives us the staff with a snake on it, the symbol, and his two daughters, Hygieia and Panacea. And this shows that since ancient times, there has been a, uh, there, if, if not opposite ends of a spectrum, distinct missions uh, of public health and medical care, and um, there are still today some things which are more explicitly and primarily curative. Surgery for a ruptured appendix and ceftaroline is our fancy new antibiotic that essentially kills all microorganisms. Um, and then at the same time, there are things which are still purely public health or purely preventive. Uh, as my three-year-old would say, vaccines don't make anybody feel better. They prevent disease, and they're specifically for that reason. But then, of course, there's, there's many important things that do both, and either do both curative and prevention, or for things that cur uh, curing or treating and preventing are the same thing. And this is my first take home point, is that HIV care, specifically treatment with antiretroviral medications, uh, is the same thing as prevention. And, and, and this slide shows a number of things to, to, to support this. What do we have in our armamentarium for tr preventing transmission of HIV infection? We know, to the extent that we know how it is transmitted, which is through behaviors, we know that reducing those behaviors uh, can, uh, can prevent transmission. But in terms of a, an, a program, something we can implement and test in a clinical trial that actually has a reduction in transmission, um, we don't have that much. We know that using condoms and, and reducing partners in safer sex practice, safer injection practices would prevent but no one has shown that doing an intervention to affect people's behavior has been, has been uh, effective. There are some studies that suggest that it helps, but a meta-analysis of eight trials really showed no, no reduction in, measurable reduction in transmission. Uh, likewise, it seems we think that treating people with genital ulcerative disease will make them less infectious, but in a large multinational randomized trial, it didn't have a measurable impact on transmission. Um, there have been a, a half dozen prominent vaccine studies, most of which have been complete failures. The only one that hasn't to date was one in Thailand, and it, there was a signal of effectiveness of 31 percent, which is certainly not something that we can scale up to a large degree, although it was exciting that there was some preliminary effect. Microbicides came out a couple of years ago with the Caprices trial that there's some effect. Male circumcision in Africa, where traditionally few men are circumcised, has a, a 60 percent benefit. And then the, the, the two that are most, most recently uh, effective, pre-exposure prophylaxis and high-risk men who have sex with men and, and, and serodiscordant heterosexuals. If you take a, a combination of antiretrovirals called Truvada daily, it decreases the probability that you'll transmit to the uninfected partner. And then the blockbuster study from last summer uh, showed that daily you know, immediate treatment with antiretroviral therapy decreases transmission by 96% among serodiscordant couples. And this is a graph from that study. They were, it was a randomized trial for people who got standard of care, which is in most settings around the world, delaying treatment until the CD4 count drops below a threshold of 350 versus starting them immediately. And people who were immediately started on therapy linked transmission, meaning some people got trans transmitted HIV, but it was from someone outside of their partner. Uh, almost didn't happen, so 96%. So the, the take-home message is that this is the most potent tool that we have. 
And this has been shown to be effective on a population level. This is an, an ecologic study, but sort of the first in what we're uh, um, exciting series of investigations in what we call community viral load. This is San Francisco. People from UCSF and the San Francisco Health Department mapped uh, districts based on the average viral load or actually the, the, uh, the, uh, the cumulative viral load in these areas and then showed how transmission is lower in areas where the mean viral load is different. And they showed temporally also that in total as community viral load here expressed as mean viral load went down, transmission went down. So on a community level if there are, if on average people have a lower viral load they're less likely to transmit and that's the principle that underlies treating HIV or preventing HIV by treating HIV. Um, okay, so that's sort of the, the, the preamble. Now I'm going to talk about criminal justice system, and this is the roadmap of the, the arguments that I'd like to make in terms of why this is an important issue. So uh, epidemics of HIV and incarceration, it sounded like hyperbole to me the first time someone referred to incarceration in the United States as, as an epidemic, but I've become a believer, and I'll show you a few, a few slides of why, why that is. Um, HIV is disproportionately high in incarcerated populations. There are well-described racial and ethnic disparities in HIV that are very similar to the racial and ethnic disparities that are seen in criminal justice systems. Um, the care for HIV that occurs in criminal justice settings is relatively good. They get standard of care, but transition of care between incarcerated and community sources is quite poor, and there's both virologic and clinical consequences of that poor continuity of, of care. And then making it all sort of the perfect storm is that when people emerge from cr criminal justice settings, have high viral loads and drug resistant virus, there's also a period of time when risk behavior is at its highest. So that is the roadmap. The bottom line for the talk is that there are urgent needs in both the uh, segment of the population that is incarcerated and likely to become incarcerated in terms of HIV treatment and prevention. But there are also unique opportunities to uh, intervene and uh, make considerable progress. So the United States currently incarcerates a greater proportion of its population than any country in the history of the world, is what I've, is what I've been led to believe. And I've heard people say that, granted, records haven't been kept uh, at a high level um, for the entire history of the world. But as far as we know, uh, we incarcerate a great number of people. About one out of every 100 US adults is currently incarcerated. We have 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's prisoners. And until recently, it, it had been growing at a significant rate. I read in the, the, the lay media that uh, 2011 was the first year in Wisconsin that the rate of no the number of people incarcerated was not higher than the previous year. So that's a, an encouraging trend, probably related to economics as much as anything. Um, but um, the uh, involvement in criminal justice systems is not, is not uniformly distributed either. The Pew Charitable Trust collects data on this, um, shows that people who are currently incarcerated in a facility is uh, small compared to the number of people who are involved in criminal justice in some other way, meaning parolees and people who are on probation, if you count those as people as under criminal justice control, it's about one in 31 Americans are currently in the system or, or on paper. Um, and Wayne County, Michigan, which is where Detroit is, is a pretty typical uh, a pretty typical rate of people who are involved in, in criminal justice system. But that uh, un, uh, hidden in, in that fact is uh, high neighborhood to neighborhood variation in the rate of incarceration. In Detroit, it's one in 22, and certain on the east side of in Brewer Park is one sixteen, and there are some census blocks in this area where it's one in one in seven. Um, so highly um, uh, uh, clustering, similar to the clustering of HIV in, in poor areas. So p the population who is involved in criminal justice has a three to four fold higher HIV prevalence. Um, although the majority of people who are incarcerated are men. Women who are incarcerated are a particularly high group, and their HIV serum prevalence nationwide is 2% compared to 0.4% uh, in the national, in regular population. And it varies by state, and probably the data collection and data quality varies quite a bit by state. But we are medium to low prevalence in Wisconsin. New York was the highest in this review by the Bureau of Justice Statistics of a uh, little less than 6% overall. HIV is not only overrepresented in, in correctional settings, but 
conditions that are comorbid with HIV, which uh, make, dif make it more difficult to treat and control, are also more common in correctional settings. 50% of people who are in state prisons meet a DSM-IV criteria for drug dependence. 20% have a history of injection drug use. And it's estimated that of people who would use heroin in the, in, the, in the country, one out of three every year has some interaction with criminal justice. Uh, mental illness is also high, 50 to 65% have a psychiatric diagnosis. And viral hepatitis, which has similar risk factor for transmission as HIV, also very, very high, relatively speaking, in, in uh, criminal justice settings. Racial disparities I mentioned a moment ago. Blacks are incarcerated at six times the rate of whites. For drug-related offenses, it's 13, 13 times as likely. 67% um, of drug convictions, but less than 13% of the population is African American. Um, I didn't realize this until returning to campus and uh, meeting with Pam Oliver, uh, but Dane County is about as bad as it gets with respect to racial disparities in incarceration. Statewide, it is about 20 to 1, meaning the, the rate of incarceration for black Wisconsinites is 20-fold that of, uh, for black, 20-fold greater than that for whites, and Dane County is about the worst of the worst. And then the well-described racial and ethnic disparities in HIV prevalence uh, by race and ethnicity. Um, again, 50, greater than 50% of the new diagnoses, less than 13% of the US population. Um, not only prevalence, though, but of new cases, there are clusters, and there is uh, disturbing evidence that HIV epi the growth of the HIV epidemic is greatest in young men who have sex with men, and data from the public health, uh, the Division of Public Health in Wisconsin really contributed to the acknowledgement of this. And this was a, an MMWR that was compiled with the people in our, uh, from, in our state showing that in Milwaukee County, there was a 144 increase among black men who have sex with men aged 15 to 29. Um, and then also from our Division of Public Health, these data are for hepatitis C, but also parallel transmission risk for, for HIV. Um, and there are uh, increasing, in certain clusters of the state, there was a greater than 200% increase in the prevalence of hepatitis C in these two areas, the north central cluster of six counties and in Manitowoc County. Um, and this is also a, uh, this was a predominantly white population that was affected, but also of low so socioeconomic status, 50, less than 50% of having finished um, high school, 82% were unemployed, 53% did not have health insurance, and the vast majority had been incarcerated at some point. So although Wisconsin is a low prevalence state for HIV, we have some evidence that it is increasing, uh, risk behavior and transmission is, is increasing in areas that I would consider to be uh, more marginalized, vulnerable, or have less access to the healthcare system. This is a bit of an add-on slide, but I like to, I like to add it anytime I talk about racial disparities in HIV infection. Um, this was presented at the International AIDS Conference in Vienna, and to my knowledge, has not been published as a paper yet. But it's a very simple, it's a very simple um, example of stratification of epidemiologic data. So, the prevalence of HIV by income in, in the United States has a pretty stark step off with with um, increasing annual household hold income. If you control for neighborhood or or census tract related income or poverty, the overall U.S. population does not have uh, racial and ethnic disparities. So, so this graph, bet I'll try to state it clearly. So if you just limit to U.S. poverty areas, areas that, ha that have median incomes in low, low areas, the racial and ethnic disparities disappear. There's no significant difference between white, black, and Hispanic, whereas overall there is uh, stark differences as, as we've seen. So, uh, it's a reminder to look, you know, that it may not be race exclusively or race at all, um, but neighborhood level socioeconomic factors uh, and and, um, and uh, structural reasons for the persistent uh, HIV epidemic. So the summary thus far, it's sort of the, in the background slide. So the epidemics of HIV and the U.S. correctional population share these characteristics. They're, they're geographically concentrated, predominantly among urban areas of low socioeconomic socioeconomic status. Um, there are striking racial and ethnic disparities that are related to the above. Disproportionately affects the urban poor, and there's a higher prevalence of drug abuse and mental illness. So this, re this returns to take-home message number one. 
Um, this was from a, a, a very high profile analysis that really contained no data. It was also, this was presented at, at, at the Cape Town International Meeting, AIDS meeting, and presented in, in the Lancet. And it is a mathematical model showing that uh, if you look at a high prevalence area, as, such as South Africa, what would be the effect of scaling up antiretroviral therapy? Again, the principle is that treating people with antiretroviral therapy stops HIV replication in the body. People have some residual viremia because the virus is escaping from latently infected cells. But it, these combination medications essentially shut off replication, rendering people essentially non-infectious. The problem is scaling it up. So, but if you could, if you could roll out and have universal voluntary testing and immediate, HR, H, uh, immediate antiretroviral therapy, um, so diagnosing everybody and getting people on therapy right away, this is what we could do to the incidence rate in a high area, a high prevalence area like South Africa. S doing something in the middle, which is what's currently the, uh, the sort of standard approach, meaning waiting to when people is less, have a CD4 count of less than 350, uh, would reach a, a plateau but fail to uh, make a significant dent in the epidemic. So this raised, a, you know, raised uh, it was controversial. It was raised, started a lot of discussion. That's what it was intended to do. But you know, at first glance, all we need to do is get medications to everybody, and we could stop HIV within 50 years, and it would cost about $50 billion. So it sounds like a good idea. But this, the second take-home message th that I want to emphasize is that there are extraordinarily difficult uh, problems implementing this. Although we, you know, the data are clear that treating H HIV is the best way to prevent transmission of HIV, doing that on a large scale has uh, many inherent challenges. And this is a, another review of, of published literature from various sources that shows of the 1.1 million people we believe to be infected in the United States, um, how many have realized the full potential or the full benefit of antiretroviral therapy? Um, and it's about 19% of them. And the reason is because each of these steps has inherent challenges. Of the 1.1 million people infected, 20% do not realize they're infected. They've either never been tested or they um, were, have acquired since they were last tested and, and are unaware. People who are aware of their infection, many have never seen a provider for HIV care. The people who have seen a provider at least once, uh, I think that's less than less than 80 or 75 percent have a sustained engagement with a care provider. Um, of those, few stay on their medications, and of those, few have sort of fully effective medications. So it's, um, despite the promise of this therapy, you know, utilizing a complex medical intervention for a public health benefit, um, although it's the best we have right now, it's very difficult to implement. And so how does that relate to criminal justice systems? Um, well, to, you know, to go back, a couple of these parts are were pretty easy in a so-called captive population. And knowing, as we know, that people who are high risk for HIV tend to cycle in the criminal justice system more than with those with, with fewer risks, uh, this could be an opportunity to identify new cases to maybe make a dent in this step off. And we also know uh, from data that I'll show is that treatment can be, could be administered pretty effectively in these settings also. So this the, uh, opportunity was recognized by the National Institute of Health and predominantly through the National Institute of Drug Abuse, but with co-funding from uh, NIMH and uh, Allergy and Infectious Diseases, uh, they set aside uh, somewhere around $100 million to fund 10 to 12 large uh, initiatives with, through R01 funding to test this model of seek, test, and treat. So find people who are, did not know they were infected, get them on treatment, and thereby lower community viral load. Um, and they, this was a, a, a press release. Um, there were probably in, uh, I think there were a dozen, a dozen sites, uh, one in Milwaukee, which I'll talk about, others in Texas and North Carolina. Um, um, and these have been just now up, up and running. I think most of them are in their first or second year of funding. And the, you know, the, the message from this RFA was the correctional settings represent a critical opportunity to reduce overall HIV incidence by diagnosing and treating HIV in an underserved population of high-risk individuals. So it's more succinctly stating what I've said in the last 15 slides. Um, so I'll first start about, talk about testing and then treatment. Um, testing uh, inside and outside of correctional populations, there has been an effort underway in the past six years to increase the number of people who have been tested. Um, we've recognized that 20% uh, of people don't have 
don't know their status for some time. And CDC's campaign to this was to try to, within healthcare settings, try to um, implement a, a regimen of universal, or what we call opt-out testing. So I mean, as part of routine healthcare, the same way you get assessed for smoking, the same way that you get childhood immunizations, it should be a part where people get offered an HIV test. Um, and this specifically states that this includes correctional settings. So this has been a, a goal or a desire for the past six years. The data after four or five years say that it hasn't made a big, a big impact. Um, after three years, uh, uh, I think that this CDC director released an announcement that the number of Americans who had been tested for HIV had increased from 40% to 45% over the first four years after this, which is still pretty, still pretty poor. That comes to about 15 million people, which is significant. Um, but to think that it's peop that, that um, testing people in healthcare settings is going to really chip away at that 20% when we know that people who are at highest risk are not good users of healthcare uh, is probably means that we, there are other things that we, that we need to, to do other than limited to healthcare settings. So how does HIV testing in, in uh, correctional settings work currently? Well, as of last time it was reviewed, um, there were uh, only 21 out of 50 state prison systems had a formal program where they would I, you know, say we test everybody on admission or we screen people for risk factors then do testing. So those are sort of the two big approaches, risk-based versus universal. Only 21 out of 50 had either one of those. For most it was, I think, probably left up to the discretion of a provider and it was not written in policy. Um, of those that have, there's, there's some evidence in the slide that I'll show that this, the opt uh, the, the opt-out, meaning universally offering testing, seems to be working in, in terms of getting more people tested. Um, and the, the, the impetus for uh, preferring that as a strategy is that people who were in prison systems were diagnosed with HIV for the first time, 42% had never said that they had risk factors. Or if you did risk-based testing and, screen, and tested only people who screened positive, uh, they, would, they would not have received a test. Um, these are old data, uh, but I was curious and, and reviewed the, the best evidence that was around. If you universally offer people HIV tests, who says yes and who says no? And the majority of people, I think, anecdotally say yes, but although the published data said that it's lower than, than I think the impression from most people who work in corrections state. North Carolina, the most recent, it was 61%. It, it was, gosh, 1990 is when Wisconsin published a paper about this, and 70% um, accepted in Maryland was quite a bit lower. So this is a, um, some, a group in North Carolina that formally looked at when they changed their policy in the state prison system to a opt-in versus it's either requested by the inmate or the discretion of a provider to opt out where part of your in medical intake is we will screen you for HIV unless you tell us not to. Um, and they made a big, uh, um, they made a quite a big jump immediately from October 08 to November 08 when they changed this. You know, black is the people who uh, were new admissions to the criminal justice system, and then this is the, the gray is the number tested. And they got up to 80, 90% relatively, relatively quickly. So it's feasible that we can at least test more people just by making a simple policy change. So that was testing. Now for treatment, um, treatment in, in prisons is um, actually probably just as good as treatment in the community. This is a uh, analysis from a group at Yale, similar to as we have in here, the Department Division of Infectious Diseases, the HIV providers at that academic setting provide the HIV care to people who are currently incarcerated. And so this was a retrospective review of the patients that they treated. And so they're patting themselves on the back a little bit. And so the 99% of the people who were, they were seen actually got standard care. So they you know, followed the guidelines of should be started at what CD4 count and what medications and they're on the right medications. Um, and it, um, and they had a change, you know, there, there was actually clinical or laboratory evidence of benefit. So median CD4 or mean CD4 count at, at baseline when people were incarcerated were 330. By the time they left, it was 440. So a significant change. Um, and as a clinician, I, uh, more, you know, more so than as an epidemiologist, I like to think of HIV viral load as a dichotomous variable. Uh, understanding the, all the issues with the statistical power side, because for anti for HIV treatment, we care about that their viral load is undetectable. We want them to be non-infectious. We want there to be no viral replication, and that really, really reduces the risk of clinical uh, of clinical complications. So, 59% had achieved that that benchmark of having an undetectable viral load, which is lower than you would want it, but is actually in practice similar to what 
they probably have at the outpatient HIV clinic in New Haven. So it's, uh, it's on, on the order of, of, um, of success. And so this is the, the problem then, and this figure shows, it's a little difficult to, imper to interpret. So on this level, on this axis is change in HIV viral load during incarceration. So if you were on this side of zero, uh, that means your viral load went down while you were in prison. That's, that's good, we want. So the vertical axis is change after release to the community. And the caveat is they could only assess this on people who were released and then reincarcerated, and they took their viral load up when they came back to prison as the, to reflect what their viral load was in the community. And so this means it was higher than when they left. So the, the short uh, explanation is that the bulk of people in this quadrant means that they had their viral load go down while they were in prison, and then it went back up when they came, when they came out. Um, again, I think it's a little more meaningful to talk about it uh, as dichotomous variable, meaning undetectable viral load. Whereas in the previous slide, I showed 58% of people had an undetectable viral load in prison. Only two out of 292 people had an undetectable viral load when they came back. So less than 1% compared to 59%. So this is really the problem. It's we can deliver good care. We can render people essentially non-infectious. Um, but that benefit is not sustained when people go back into the community. We looked at this with some of our data here at UW, and um, we'll be presenting this at the retrovirus conference next month. Um, we see, it with, I think since about 2000, 2002, we have seen all of the HIV infected inmates in the Wisconsin Department of Corrections who, who per, you know, uh, consent to getting medical care for HIV. Um, and we've, since then, we've seen 263 individuals. 134 of them, we've seen them, and then they were released, and then ended up back in prison, we saw them a second time, so we could do a similar analysis of what was their HIV control during versus after. Um, our median HIV RNA um, at the time of pre-release was 289, which was quite good, and then it had increased. For, for reference, depending on the laboratory, under 400 is what we call fully suppressed or below the limit of detection. Um, so that's uh, actually pretty good to pat ourselves on the back. Um, but similar to the Yale study, uh, on average, most had an elevated viral load when they were re, when they were reincarcerated. The genotype data was something that hasn't been available in most in most other studies, and we did it on a on a limited scale, meaning there was a clinic there was clinical laboratory data of who had which uh, patients had developed resistance to antiretroviral drugs during that interim period. So it was only available for a 38 out of these 134 that came back. Um, but at the time of reincarceration, 60% had some resistance to antiretroviral therapy. And for the uh, uh, people with, um, who, with the less background in HIV, resistance is what happens when there is ongoing viral replication in the setting of subtherapeutic levels of antiretroviral drugs. So there's a high rate of turnover, a high rate of, of um, replication, and natural selection favors the mutant resistant subpopulations that are resistant, and then that can populate, and that's how treatment failure occurs. Um, we showed that of the that had a genotype right before they left and right when they came out, 80% of them had mutations that they didn't have before. So this is not surprising, but we actually demonstrated that people in this interim of going out of prison and back in, and then coming back in is a really high risk period for treatment failure, and then consequences of treatment failure, meaning these people have fewer therapeutic options than they did before. Medications that were effective for them before they were incarcerated are no longer effective. They need to get a, either a regimen that is dif more difficult to take, has more side effects, less convenient. So it's, it's, it's potentially a big problem. And this, is, and this is permanent. So once you develop these mutations, you can't use them again. Um, so why does it happen? Uh, why is follow-up care so poor? Uh, actually, this study doesn't say why it happens. It, all, it just highlights how terrible it actually is. So Texas has a, a much higher HIV-infected prison population than, than Wisconsin or Connecticut. And this was a retrospective study of people who received HIV care in prison, and they had a similar success rate. Seventy percent of people treated in Texas prisons had an undetectable viral load. And then they made use of, uh, available of uh, publicly available data from the AIDS Drug Assistance Program. Essentially what they were able to do was when people were treated for HIV in prison, when they were discharged, they were given a 10-day supply of their HIV medications, and then you're on your own to some degree. The 
pretty much everyone was not insured, so by virtue of that, we're eligible for the drug assistance program in a centrally managed database so that anytime someone hit, gets a prescription filled who's part of this AIDS drug assistance program, um, it shows, they track it, it shows up in the database. So because everyone was on this drug assistance program, um, no one had insurance, and they all got a prescription at the time of left, they were able to see what proportion of people filled their prescription within 10 days of leaving prison, which is what it would take to have no interruption in their therapy. And it was, uh, it was, it was quite bad. 5.4% um, filled their prescription before they ran out of medications. And it, the best it got after 60 days, meaning they had only been, only been off of their medications for two months, only got to 30%. So this is um, really, a, 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 a really a big challenge and really a big problem in terms of um, being, trying to get continuity of benefit of people that we're treating. Because it costs a lot of, it's a lot of resources uh, to treat people in prison. And this is showing very starkly that that benefit is not being translated to people when, when they re-enter the community. So the, 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 the data on the previous slide really come from prison-based data sources, um, which is inherently biased. If we're only looking at recidivists or people who are incarcerated a second time, uh, it's, it's sort of a, a, a biased uh, observation of what's actually happening of everybody who gets released. So the, this is the, the next few slides are data that I was uh, involved in collecting and analyzing. And we used a community-based cohort with a high prevalence of injection drug use and um, by virtue of that, a high, uh, high incidence of incarceration. Uh, the ALIVE study, which is an ongoing community-based cohort of injection drug users in, in Baltimore, was that of people who have HIV and are in treatment in this cohort, what effect does incarceration have um, of the longitudinal care? So if people are getting care in the community and they get incarcerated, is that actually better for their long-term care or worse? Um, and then re related, because we, we, assess a, uh, we extensively assess risk behavior um, at, uh, at every study encounter, we were able to say, well, does incarceration either influence or is it associated with either increases or decreases in the behavior that would place others at risk for transmission? Um, this is the study headquarters. This is the Hopkins School of Public Health a few blocks away. It's in a very poor neighborhood. There are, there are by several fold, there are more houses than people, meaning two out of every three houses is boarded up in, in, in the city. Um, uh, above, of the 4,500 people who have been following the study, about 25% have HIV. This analysis is only limited to those who have HIV infection. And the analysis, you know, again, my bias to look at viral suppression as a, as a binary outcome. I, I was just curious in looking at people who had achieved a, a, an HIV viral load that was undetectable. So I want to see if people, if people who are getting good care in the community and they get incarcerated, does that interrupt their care in the same way of people who get care in the prison and, and go back to the community? So I uh, started by looking at people who had an undetectable viral load assess them six months later to see whether they continue to have an undetectable viral load, and then, risk, and then incarceration was one risk factor among several that could be associated with a, a change, meaning a, a loss of virologic failure, or loss of virologic suppression. So uh, the results, there were 427 people who at some point had achieved an undetectable viral load, meaning were, in, were effectively receiving HIV care. Um, and they accounted for just over 2,000 visits. So people could be in this data set numerous times if they were in care and had an undetectable viral load and then whatever happened and then at a different time they had an undetectable viral load. Um, and just looking at these instances where people had an undetectable viral load, if we followed them six months, which is the next time they came to the study, 26.3% of them no longer had an, an undetectable HIV viral load. So again, for, a, for the non-clinical audience, that's uh, atrocious. We expect people to, you know, obviously they're on this therapy lifelong. When we look at clinical trials of HIV care, um, at 96 weeks, uh, we expect in, in, uh, in, in clinical trials, you know, 90 or plus percent are can still have an undetectable viral load. So virologic failure is defined as that you, the expectation is that people get an undetectable viral load on therapy, and then it should remain that way indefinitely unless they stop, stop their medications. Um, and then it, it, it turned out be, becoming incarcerated in the interim between the, that first visit and second visit was a significant correlate of, of virologic failure. So overall, if people weren't incarcerated 24% of the time, they had developed virologic failure, meaning the fire load went up. If they were incarcerated, it was 53% and for an overall odds ratio of, of 2.4. 
So uh, in, in the alive study, we've there, there are a lot of usual suspects in terms of what measurable variables are associated with poor HIV care outcomes or poor substance abuse outcomes. And uh, adjusting for all of those, in people, you know, um, alcohol use and depression and people in the intensity of people who are injecting, people who are inject every day are in, in many ways uh, less high functioning or less revival than people who are abstinent. Uh, so adjusting for all of those things, um, incarceration was even more significantly associated with uh, virologic failure. And we were able to separate incarcerations lasting less than 30 days compared to greater than 30 days. Um, and the rationale for that was that people who go to prison and get on therapy, there may actually be a, a beneficial effect. As we saw, many people get on therapy for the first time while they're in prison, um, whereas a hypothesis was that short you know, jail stays or short prison stays would have more of a disrupting effect on, on people's HIV care. And that is, you know, that's what we saw. The, the last part to this analysis was to, to look at risk behavior among people who reported incarceration. Um, the percent of people sharing needles or syringes um, overall, if, uh, and this is within the past six months, so we asked them simultaneously, in the past six months, have you been, did you inject, or it might have even been, we asked them last three weeks or last six months, um, have you engaged in these behaviors? this one being sharing needles or syringes. People who were recently incarcerated, 23% said that yes, they were, and 11% said no, they weren't. I was curious to know whether people's um, HIV viral load was related to this. I mean, were people who were ha had a high viral load and were therefore much more infectious, did they cr either curb their behavior? And, and the answer was no, it, it wasn't. So ir irrespective of whether people were on treatment or out of treatment, um, the uh, uh, transmission risk behaviors were relatively high and much higher in people that were recently incarcerated. And granted, this does not apply causality. I mean, people who are using a lot are probably more likely to become incarcerated. Um, but, but still, the, the people with that, that marker of increased risk of being incarcerated, really a significantly high number of people um, sharing needles. Um, and this is the, you know, the other risk behavior which we, we have found to be uh, to be important, uh, shooting galleries, uh, people who haven't watched The Wire or, or other Baltimore-based dramas are sort of public injecting venues, usually an abandoned house where people come and uh, inject uh, in groups. And people, you know, sometimes they have people whose job, who are highly skilled at injecting other people who have, have poor veins. So this is about the highest risk behavior that we have, sort of really injecting in public places. And uh, people who were incarcerated, 9% had reported this behavior in the past couple weeks where, where um, it was uh, lower, but still up, still significant in, in the, the groups. So this is uh, just a recap of the, um, my roadmap slide for why I think this is a, a compelling public health issue. Um, there are high, there are still unacceptably high numbers of people with HIV and people who are incarcerated in, in the country. HIV is, is uh, elevated in these populations. Care is, although good while they're in prison, transitions of care and continuity of care is very poor, and there are virologic consequences to this. And all of this happens at the same time where people are placing others at high risk of, of contracting HIV through high-risk behaviors. Um, so uh, the, the last part, I went, and this is less formal, and I'd actually even be happy to take, this, take questions or comments you know, a, as we go through these, is just to talk about, well, uh, what are our opportunities to, to work on on this issue here in, in the state, and um, so I'll try to say we have some uh, some good opportunities, and it's, uh, there's some evidence that there are pockets of increased need. We also have some data sources and institutional strengths that really could make uh, Wisconsin, both UW and the Public Health and Department of Corrections, really leaders in this area. Um, so, what are the research priorities based on? You know, this, this is my opinion based on my my, my work in this area. Um, so still, even in areas like North Carolina where there's, there are very highly effective collaborations between the medical centers, the HIV care group, and the Department of Corrections, they're still, they're testing 80 to 90 percent, which is good, but are they capturing everybody? There still may be missed opportunities of people uh, of, of un, unrecognized HIV infection. Um, the, uh, a group in Milwaukee with collaborations with, with uh, investigators here, Jim Sossman at, at our clinic, and David Seal with the Center for AIDS Intervention Research in Milwaukee um, have, uh, were awarded one of the grants from NIDA that I discussed uh, to do seek test and treat in criminal justice settings. Uh, their 
proposal um, highlighted the fact that across the Department of Corrections, we do actually a very good job. We have universal, the universal testing of people who are sentenced and they go through the intake at the um, Dodge Correctional Facility and there is essentially universal testing there and that's going well. But there's a big gap in pe among people in inner city Milwaukee who, who pass through what's called the Milwaukee Secure Detention Facility. It's a specific institution that, that has high turnover and it's specifically people who have, uh, are arrested on parole or probation violations. So it's high throughput, um, but it's under DOC management, but they don't have the same intake. They don't go through Dodge Correctional, so they don't have the same intake. So they really saw a gap in testing. They saw a high-risk population and got uh, funding to carry out universal testing in this, in this setting um, and also screen people for, for high-risk negatives and then had some, some innovative plans to track high-risk negatives as they return to the community through surveillance data and through the, the health department. Um, another, you know, uh, other areas which I um, unfortunately don't have, uh, have uh, information to share about projects that are addressing them is that in community corrections, so people that aren't in facilities um, but have uh, interaction, frequent interaction with, with criminal justice through probation or parole systems, uh, maybe an opportunity to find high-risk individuals there. And then county jails is very different. So the State Department of Corrections is, is pretty, you know, pretty well-run, well-organized, and the policies that they make you know, at the central office in Madison are pretty well implemented. But county jails, I mean, where people get picked, when they get picked up for whatever and go to a county jail, particularly in outlying areas, they don't have budgets to do testing, they don't have budgets to give treatment. Uh, anecdotally, I have patients who I, I see in the criminal in the prisoner HIV clinic here who um, show up with a elevated viral load right off the bat where they had been controlled for years. And the reason was because they were in a county jail far northern Wisconsin and their pharmacy didn't have antiretrovirals. As the system uh, would have it, they were there for two months and so they went two months without their medication. So, so lost opportunities and very challenging problems in these low prevalence areas, uh, but it's a big problem for individuals who, who re rely on con you know, continuous access to care. So, um, so some important targets that, uh, to, to address. So evaluating post-incarceration retention and care. You know, my you know, central message for this was that post-incarceration retention and care is really the, the, um, uh, the most important issue for making an improvement here. Um, and we don't really know what are the determinants. We know that it's uniformly poor. We don't know why some do better than others. The, the Texas study with the, the JAMA article, which, uh, which showed only 5% had, did, did not fail to fill their prescription, they looked at a bunch of predictors to see what would be, what maybe distinguished people who followed up from those who didn't. And the only thing they found were that people that got someone to sit with them and fill out the ADAP, the Age Drug Assistance Program application, those people seem to do better. So it's some, there, it, it tells me that some, for lack of a better word, hand-holding or some assistance or some support in navigating the system is what is, could be helpful in these high-risk populations who are low-literate.